Jeff. Season three, baby. We're back. We're back. We're back. We took last week off. We did. Okay, a little behind the scenes. We actually took like two weeks off because spring break (laughs) and stuff. Kids. And so like (laughs) this happened, um, when was this happened? Thanksgiving and this happened Christmas and we didn't Uh whatever, but like we, we do. Once in February anniversary. We like, well you, yeah. yeah, we like to spend time with our families. We do. We like That's, them. It's a thing we enjoy. So we Jeff and I enjoy time. being married, but not to each other. And I mean, I, I mean, love you, Jeff. I, really I was going to say, if you ask, that way, like, if you ask my wife, she might, she might tell you that we're, we're pretty close to it, but you know, <laughs> I still love, I still love you as well. It's there great. you go. There you go. That's, that's uh yeah, we, we like hanging out with our families. Uh, and God bless. Hey, if they're ever watching, which my, I don't know if, if your wife ever watches Jeff, mine does not. But should you ever watch either one of our two wives or our children, thanks for letting us do this. Yeah, totally. It's great. <laughs> and my wife is awesome. She doesn't listen to any of my podcasts. She does occasionally read the transcripts to my Starfleet Leadership Academy. Now, can I tell you how awesome your wife is, Jeff? Yeah. I, I, noti- I noticed this this past probably, I guess it was like closer to like Black Friday last year. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't Oh, like I think I saw a thing she put out on Twitter. Okay. Okay. She does. And it was, and I didn't know that she did this, uh, but it, but she went, here's my holiday gift giving guide. She wrote a, she wrote like a blog post on a, I think I texted you about this. Yeah. I was like, and she's like, here's a pair of boots that I really like. And here's a bag. And I'm like, these could actually be good ideas for my wife too. And here's a facial mask that's really good and here's an awesome well, pen let's give her a little and credit because if i remember like she had some like Jeanette at home genetic engineering kits like she had some right pretty, yeah yeah I mean, she has some cool stuff. and then like there was like a, a section for kids like here's some cool stuff to get for the kids and you get all the way down to the bottom and it was or how about an annual patreon membership to the starfleet leadership academy podcast improve your leadership <laughs> And I was like, she totally just pimped her husband's show. That's awesome. And it worked. Like I did it. Yeah. So I do my tears a lot differently for Starfleet Leadership Academy than we do here for Babylon 5 because I I, I offer coaching and things like that. And I have permanent coaching. Well, I would say permanent, but I have contracted coaching clients because of that post she wrote. So yeah, she's, she's amazing. That's awesome. That's awesome. At, well, at Giselle Aiken, if you want to follow her, okay. uh, it's G I wasn't going to say her name. I, I didn't know if you wanted to put it out there, but now that you did shout out Giselle, you're awesome. We're the secret to a to our success as a, as a couple is that we are each other's biggest fans. And so you guys really are, you really are like, I can attest to that. Like you guys yeah. are, yeah, awesome. I love everything about her. So it's at Giselle Aiken, G I Z Z E L L E. Her mom is a refugee and didn't know how to spell when she was born so really? she did her best for the record if i was to spell giselle that is probably how i would spell it too yeah i did not yeah. when we were dating and that's one of the reasons it worked because i said i wrote her name the wrong way and she's like oh it's really nice hey next time can you spell my name right <laughs> i'm like we're gonna be okay <laughs> there you go hey listen if you could just be that blunt with each other go for it go for hey, it hey uh, should we talk about yeah. some babylon five I would love to talk about some Babylon five because you know what? I got baseball going on right now and I about got kicked out of the park today. So I need to, (sighs) you know, that's what you do with baseball though, right? Like you, you start saying stuff and you forget like, like, you know, in like a professional stadium, they're way down there, but like at the kids ballpark, they're 10 feet in front of you. And so they can hear you. (laughs) And they're just somebody who's like kid plays also. So they're like, don't want it. Like, Right, right. You know, but there's, but I'm also an old baseball coach. So there's the piece of me that's like, yeah, throw me out. Let's make a point. I'm going to make a big fuss and a big scene to have you throw me out and it'll fire up my team and we'll go in. <laughs> I will, I will lay on that grenade. <laughs> Let's do it. Oh, I was happened to my daughter's soccer game. Not too long ago too. <laughs> and they don't do that in soccer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about Babylon 5. We should talk about Babylon 5. Let's do it. Let's do it. Jeff, uh, what you guys are about to watch out there, if you're new to us, if you're joining us uh, for the first time here at Babylon 5 for the first time, Jeff and I over there, we are watching this 30-year-old show. Babylon. It's not even 30, 30 years. Are we down to 25 yet? I think it's like 12. We're in season. I can't do the math. Yeah, whatever. So anyway, 30-year-old show. Something. We're watching a 30-year-old show for the very first time. Jeff and I have never seen it. We're completely unspoiled. We have no idea what happens. Please keep it that way. 
like, subscribe, comment down below. But we're going to record an audio podcast, but you guys get the much better, much cooler feed because you get to watch how the sausage is made, how the cookie is baked, how the lasagna is assembled. There you go. I like that one, right? Go. Yeah. Uh, you guys get to watch how all that happens. That means you get the bloopers, the outtakes, the rabbit trails, all the stuff that Jeff over there is going to clean up out of the audio version. You guys get the whole thing, and you get to see how much we screw this up as we go along. I know. So <laughs> there have been some doozies. Well, hey, new season, season three. Yeah, we got a new back back background here. This is together. cool. I'm yeah. I'm a fan of this. Yeah, it's cool. And I'm about to drop some new theme music i haven't heard it yet i know jeff i'm so excited i have not heard this yet you you sent me a preview and i was kind of like okay you got to change some set. Yep. like it wasn't the final so i don't know what the final version is well and just heads up i listened to it through the system i've got one or two level tweaks i'm gonna make but this okay. is basically its final version so okay. are we ready are we okay the the outro at the end did that change or is that still the same it's, it's so good i'm like just that, that little outro. like blop at the okay yeah don't mess yeah here's it. our That's outro cool. yeah. i love this part with the drums right here it's my first time yeah oh and then yeah like that's that that is the perfect way to end a podcast yeah um gonna hold on i to can't that. i can't wait to hear the opening intro so jeff whenever you are ready let's go, go man First time. You knew your heart. Something, somewhere will make a difference. It's a mockery. I mean, we're not some, some deep space franchise. This station is about something. The year is 2023. The name of the podcast, Babylon 5, for the first time. Jeff, well, that's awesome! Yeah, thank you, thank that's you. That's awesome! <laughs> <laughs> I want to bring up Garibaldi's piece in there. He's like, I just want to know it was all worth something. There, there's, there's a couple, yeah, there's a couple of pieces that just need to be leveled a little bit more. Jeff, that's so good. And you, you got in the Deep Space Nine yep. reference, which I was so hoping you'd be able to do that. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Okay, can we listen to it again so you can actually yeah, get it? This will be the real time. This is, this okay. is, this is uh, Babylon Five for the first time, for the second time, for the real time. First time. You knew your heart. Something, somewhere will make a difference. It's a mockery. I mean, we're not some, some deep space franchise. This station is about something. The year is 2023. The name of the podcast, Babylon 5, for the first time. Welcome to Babylon 5, for the first time. Not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I'm watching Babylon 5, Season 3, for the first time. And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Babylon 5, Season 3, for the very first time. Jeff and I are two veteran Star Trek podcasters watching this show, this season, this episode, for the very first time. And here... We have decided to apply that lens that we've gained as Star Trek podcasters where we overanalyze everything and look for those deep messages and meanings that are replete. We're applying that here to Babylon 5, and we're seeing how much do we just absolutely love, love this series. And while this is not a podcast about Star Trek, Brent and I are Star Trek podcasters and fans. So those references are going to show up from time to time. So one of the games that we play here on Babylon 5 for the first time is the rule of three. That means we each get three references to Star Trek during the entire episode. That's it. Three. One of those plays. No substitutions, exchanges, a refund. <laughs> you know, Brent, we have a YouTube channel. It's pretty cool. A lot of great, I do know that. Yeah. A lot of great people in the community there. And one Shout of out them, YouTube. Sorry. Yeah. It's all you. Somebody on YouTube, John Schaefer, left this really cool comment a while ago with a dream guest star pairing that sadly we never got, but I would be all in for. Sarah Douglas and Louise Fletcher are two of my favorite actresses when it comes to villainy, since they do it so well. And I would have loved to have seen them play off of each other in a movie or another sci-fi series before Louise passed. Death Walker uh, and Kai Wynn. 
Yeah. Face to face. Yeah. That's, uh, if I can add to that, um, oh, what is her name? Um, uh, she played Dolores Umbridge in the Harry Potter franchise. Yeah. And then she's the queen and that was it the crown. She eventually know. was no, no, but I'm talking play that, uh, that yeah, like no. that Dumb. sugary, sweet, evil lady with Louise Fletcher as Kai Wynn and, uh, Sarah Douglas you, death Walker is probably the seminal one. I still, you know who I think, she, what, what I think of when I see her picture because death Walker obviously was under all the makeup, uh, the 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 bad girl from the Superman totally. two movie Superman I think it two is. yeah, yeah. yeah that's Zahn. that's who I still see with her uh you know so that could be cool yeah. that could be cool hey John uh thanks for commenting I'm sure John Schaefer is a relatively common name I know a couple of John Schaefer's if you happen to be the guy that I know like in real life hit me a text or shoot me something and let me know you're watching because that's awesome but if you're not the John Schaefer that I know in real life. You're still awesome. And thanks for watching and listening. Well, I'm going to stick on YouTube for the next one. This one's kind of long, but I think it's also a really important one. Someone left this comment on one of the Brent watches videos a while Ooh. ago. Hey, and Brent you, watches. That's a cool series. It's going to say, if you're not watching Brent watches, you are, you are missing out on a huge aspect of what happens here at Babylon five for the first time. And by the way, that guy's an idiot over there. So you seriously know, watch at your own peril. Yeah, it's like he doesn't even understand how, you know, sci-fi and science work. What's, he doesn't know what's, what this show is about. Gosh. I think this is Star Trek. Come on. <laughs> well, Justin Marshall says, up, I Justin? know, he says, I know I'm probably going to get some flack for this comment, but just some thoughts I had as I read through the comments here. There are a lot of them saying how Brent will understand or better appreciate this episode in a season or two, or how it will make more sense as the plot develops. Aside from that being a, I remember this one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. Cool. Yeah, this go. is good. I'm going to go back and read the whole thing, but that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. That's, this is such an important comment, right? I know I'm probably going to get some flack for this comment, but just some thoughts I had as I read through the comments here. There are a lot of them saying how Brent will understand or better appreciate this episode in a season or two, or how it will make more sense as the plot develops. Aside from this being a borderline spoiler, I think it misses the point of this podcast. I think of this podcast in the same way as Mission Log, how they don't jump the Star Trek timeline in their show. Brent can only react to what he's seen so far. It would make no sense if at the end of each reaction, he just talked about how he's excited to see how the episode links up in the future and didn't evaluate it on its own standing. First time viewers did not know what was coming. And this podcast is meant to mimic that experience. I also think constantly telling them why each episode will appear so much better in a season or two is overhyping things and bound to lead to letdown. Hashtag season two. Just my opinion, <laughs> but I <laughs> just my opinion, but I think it is far better to let those reflections come in, come in time and not jump the timeline in the comments. What made Babylon five such an amazing show for me was that I did not know how much would link together or what episodes would matter more in a few seasons. The first time I watched it, it was an amazing and complete surprise to me when it happened. And I think we should be careful to not spoil that for the hosts. Yeah, Justin, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment. Jeff, you first started reading that and I was like, are you really sure you want to begin season three? Like, this is a brand new season. That, that kind of feels like we're slapping some people down. But here's what I really like about that because we're right here at the start of a new season. And there's bound to be some things here in this season that are going to happen that we're like, okay, we're we're here. We're at the midway point of the show. This is the, and the, the narrative arc, this is the, the climax, right? We've hit the rising action. This is where everything happens. And there's bound to be some things that are maybe a little overhyped. Maybe a, I'm just guessing. I don't know. We've watched one episode so far. Um, 
for people out there that are listening to this part, like I've, you know what I've started, I've started saying this, I don't know, somewhere, I think it might've been relatively early in season two, at least halfway. Don't rob us of the rewatch uh, experience either. Yeah. Because the rewatch experience is where we sit back. Now we know what's going to happen. And now we make those connections. Like, like we, what we've always invited you guys to do is to sit back laugh at us calculate if you want to have a conversation with it about it uh, with it uh uh we have a discord server that jeff and i aren't allowed on to right so you guys can go have all those conversations and say oh just wait till they see this and it connects there do you think like have all those conversations over there discord patreon.com forward slash babylon five first right number five word first yep uh (laughs) but you guys go over there and check that out but uh, uh like just join us in this show and and especially the oh well you'll see this one this one will come back around again it, like don't tell, don't tell us that we don't want to know well and let we'll me be really clear later. about it too there's no prize right there's not a prize for you being like i know all of the things and i totally told brent and jeff the things there's not a prize for that right yeah the prize in fact we saw a week ago on here the prize comes when you leave us a review and mm-hmm. you get drawn out of the hat. The fun and the community comes from having a conversation about us as first time viewers. And just like Brent said, there's a whole other community on our Patreon, on our, on our Discord server there. Dive in, right? Rip us mm-hmm. apart, rip us to shreds, laugh at us, make fun of us, get excited about a thing. You get to do all that kind of stuff, but don't ruin it for us. I, mm-hmm. We are. And what? not just us, but, but you, and the listeners yeah. and everybody, because this is all the experience together, you know, like. Like it, this is Jeff and I's experience, but we know that so many of you guys are doing this with us. Exactly. And it's so cool. And I think yeah. you get to hold on to that thing. So in the late season four into season five or whatever, and we get to go on and be like, Oh, uh, kind of like the, uh, when Lita Alexander showed up, what about a month ago? And I was like, Hey, so a couple of you people out there, I said some not cool things to, uh, uh, Matthew Ignash being one on Twitter. Um, yeah, you were kind of right about that Lita thing. But you, sure. now you get to celebrate that now, not way back here, you mm-hmm. know, a season and a half before she even is mentioned again. Yeah. And, and, you know, the other side of that is, is like when we, the, like people will hold on to stuff until we get to a spot where we have seen something and then they'll go back and they'll like connect all the dots since the gathering to this one point that we're at now. And I'm like, cool. That's the rewatch. Yeah, <laughs> let's get that on the rewatch because I, I'm not guaranteeing that Babylon five for the second time is going to happen. It's going to happen for Jeff and I on some level. Yeah. You know, and I imagine it'll probably happen on a public forum such as this, but well, I, think, I think it's safe to we'll say see. this Babylon five yeah. for the second time will not be 110 episodes long. We can no. say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be zero. That's very unlikely, but it will be less than 110 episodes, Mm -hmm. but we'll go, we'll go through it for sure. And Mm -hmm. have that, have that part of the experience. So, yeah, uh, you listen, Jeff, we said this, I don't think we've said this particular thing recently. I am so grateful for everyone who takes the time to comment and send us a message. I am that much more grateful for those of you out there. I'm going to look you in the eye, YouTube. And right in the ear, podcast people, thank you for helping protect Jeff and I through the show. Thank you for helping keep us spoiler free. Thank you for keeping the integrity of this show fully intact. You guys rock. Everybody else who leaves comments, you guys rock too. But those of you who really, really like take up the banner for this, much love. Heck yes. So Jeff, we like our comments. We do you know like our we games. Like? We like the games. We, we love do. our games. We love the game. We love our, our rule of three game. We also love the game where we get to the end of the episode and we predict what next week's episode is going to be about based solely on title alone. Never having seen the episode before, not watching uh, previews, not reading descriptions, not even looking at thumbnails, if we can help it. And last week we made two guesses. Now one, we're not going to be able to talk about until we get much further down the line. That one was, what do we think season three is going to be? What does season three entail? What, what's, what's that going to be about? 
But we did make a guess at what this particular episode was going to be about matters of honor. And this is the part of the show where we revisit that idea and see just how close we were now that we've actually seen the episode. So, Jeff, do you remember what you said matters of honor was supposed to be about? I do. In the fall of night, right, Ivanova gave Sheridan this really nice, beautifully wrapped Christmas gift. He opened it up. It was a piece of the Black Star, the ship that the Minbari ship that he was responsible for blowing up. I was pretty sure that that was going to offend some Minbari and would eventually put that whole Star Killer Sheridan thing to rest. So I was off by quite a bit, unless you want to count the opposite of the Black Star as points, but I don't. I don't think that I will. The White Star. I, I don't know. What uh, What about you? Do you remember what you guessed? Was it the White Star? Is that the name of it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the White Star. Yeah, super, um, super deep cut there. I don't think I I ever put White Star and Black Star together until this very moment. Really? I didn't. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't the, the two names didn't even connect for me. Um, although I do. I remember a long time ago, somebody sent us a tweet. Like, what do you think is better? The White Star or the Defiant? And I was like, I don't know what the White Star is. Shut up. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, it was a long time ago. And now I'm like, uh, I, I heard the name. That's where my mind went. was like. See, you're like, I don't even like White Castle that much. They're actually super overrated and kind of gross. Kind of. Hey, let's let's talk about what I said this episode. Yeah, let's do that. (laughs) Um, Hey, Jeff, just if you'll pardon me for a moment, I'm going to reach over here and pick up this uh, this this metal round object that sits upon my head. Sometimes it's gotten a little dusty over the last couple of weeks. Pardon me while I grab it. Oh, okay, okay, Yeah. And I put this right back on my head because what i said was this was going to be an episode about londo grappling with his position of what he has to do and breaking his alliance with the shadows that's what i said now that may not have been all that this episode was about but that was a significant portion of this episode uh, and i also said jakar would be building his resistance that's what i said i don't know how many points you want to give me for that one how much credit i get but you get some uh, you get I, more I think, than me. i think i hit that one pretty good though and I think that was also another read the tea leaves. It's got to happen. Eventually it's going to be right. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you keep saying this episode's about the great egg. Eventually we're going to get to another great egg episode, right? And if we don't, I'm going to be furious. I will write some very <laughs> sternly worded letters. What's crazy is because like, even if that was just a one episode off, th- like a bad first season episode that people like skip. So many people keep referencing the great egg. Yeah. It's like, this has to be something. Missing. It's gotta be anyway. So Jeff, that's what we discussed. We thought that this was going to be about, but for those people who are playing along with us at home, people maybe that didn't watch this episode before coming into listening to this show, or maybe it's just been a while since they've seen it, or maybe they didn't watch this at all. And they're just joining us for the podcast for whatever reason, which they're definitely welcome to do that. Jeff, tell us what matters of honor was actually about well we're just a few days after the devastating impacts of the fall of night little cgi dudes are floating in space piecing the station back together in the garden sheridan meets up with kosh asking all the questions that we've had burning for the last two weeks because we had the recap in between why me why save me We get more words out of Kosh than his cumulative total over the last two seasons, but he still basically says the same things. I'm a mystery, and if I'm frustrating you, good. After that, Sheridan and Ivanova greet one of the most reasonable Earth Force people ever, an Earth Force Special Intelligence Officer that served on the Zindi Council. Yeah, I think we still, I think we still count guest stars. I don't know. Well, either way, his name's Ndawi, and he's here to talk with the ambassadors about the mysterious ship that was captured by gun footage and aired on ISN. He wants to know what they know about it. Nobody from Earth recognizes it. The Len says that she's never seen it before, but that seems a little fishy. Londo says that he saw it in a dream, telling Ndawi that he saw so many of them that they blocked, they blocked out the sun. And Jakar, Jakar spills the beans. 
And Dawi asks him about it, and Jakar pulls out his book of Jaquan, along with some pamphlets and other reading materials, asking if Ndawi has a few moments to talk about his lord and savior, the dude who wrote about the shadows. And speaking of shadows, Darth Londo is ready to break up with him. He's gotten all he wants out of this relationship and feels like the Centauri can handle it now. Morden's cool with it, but just they want to figure out how they're going to handle visitation with the kids, who gets to keep which friends, and who gets to keep the house. Morden's got a PowerPoint ready, and he shares it with Londo. Ugh, breakups can get so messy. Really, he's not asking for that much. He just wants to ensure the Centauri don't cross some line in space, and that they capture a Drazi homeworld, or a Drazi world for the shadows. Which, Londo doesn't need to worry his pretty little Vidal Sassoon head about at all. You see, Morden has already decided who gets to keep Lord Rifa as a friend. And it's not Londo. He's already arranged for the attack on this planet. I mean, why he would want Zagro 7, though? Pfft, that's a mystery. Or is it? Earlier in the episode, we saw Drazi smuggling a smaller ship off of a planet that we literally just learned is Zagro 7. On that little ship, one of the new faces in the opening credits is Marcus the Ranger. The other new face that we get in the opening credits is Zach Allen, Kanicki, he made it, he made it to the main credits. Well, the Drazi helped Marcus get off the planet so that he could let Sheridan and Delenn know that the Ranger training facility there is in danger. Delenn, Lanier, and Marcus beat up some thugs and down below, it is super awesome. And after all that, they get Sheridan and Ivanova, and they sneak off to the planet. But on the way, they transfer to a new ship. A very, very visually clearly Minbari ship that apparently doesn't look like a Minbari ship at all, because I guess it has some Vorlon tech on it too. It's called the White Star, and it's meant for Sheridan and his crew to use against the shadows. And it is a beast. It's big super fast, can open jump points, and has a ton of firepower. Oh, and it has artificial gravity. We see some of the rifts in the Grey Council who don't know about this ship, as its crew is all from the religious cast. Timing is totally on their side. They get to Zagro 7 and start clearing out a whole bunch of mines so that the rangers can escape. Just as they're about to finish, a shadow ship pops into space. Sheridan plays his cards close to his vest as they engage the shadow. He doesn't want him to know anything about this new ship. He digs deep into his toolbox as he fights them. He escapes into a jump gate, immediately followed by the shadow. He brings the White Star out of hyperspace at the deserted and looted Markhab homeworld, and just as the shadow emerges, he opens a jump point in the jump gate, causing a massive explosion. <laughs> what a bonehead maneuver. Well, it blows the shadow to bits and allows them to return to the station, leaving the White Star some, somewhere? Um, I'm sure it's safe, I guess. Well, Sheridan pulls Ivanova, Garibaldi, Franklin, Delenn, and Marcus into the observation lounge, <coughs> the meeting room, and forms a war council. These are the people that he trusts and that know about the shadows and the rangers, which apparently includes Ivanova because Ivanova is always right. They're going to meet every two weeks with no ground rules, except the ground rule that this is going to be a psychologically safe place where anybody can say anything, especially if it has to do with the shadows. Oh, and do you remember that really cool Earth Force guy, Ndawi? Well, he reports back to a senator on Earth and he gives her his report. He says that nobody knows anything outside of some super old myths and legends. He leaves, and a psychop walks in, along with Morden. The senator assures him that the senator assures him that nobody that really matters knows anything about the shadows. Their secret is still safe. The psychop wants to leverage this to do more evil things to Earth citizens, and everybody seems cool with it. And Brent. Brent, we were right. We've been right all along. Psycor is totally working with the shadows. What was your reaction to Matters of Honor? Jeff, I got to tell you, 
I enjoyed this as a, I can't, it's hard to call this a season premiere because it didn't feel like a big monumental season premiere. It just felt like the next episode after the fall of night, which may sound a little weird, like as a, as a podcaster, but in this day and age of, you know, you set up this super big season finale and then you have this super big season premiere. This was a little bit of a breath of fresh air to just be like, let's move into the next. We introduced a new cast member, which I don't know about you, Jeff. I did watch the opening to the, to the show. I did as well. And this guy's in the credits. Hopefully we see him more than six times. I, I immediately like this new guy, Marcus. Yeah. A thousand times more than I liked Keffer. I have a huge problem with Marcus though. And it has nothing to do with Marcus. It has everything to do with uh, Jason Carter, the actor who plays him. Oh yeah. Do you know what he was in? I think it was just before this role. So he had a recurring role on Beverly Hills, 90210. And, and you don't, you don't know this about He broke about up me. with the girl that you had a crush on. In no, life. no, oh, okay. no, but no. So he, uh, he, he played a character named Roy Randolph and he directed a play at uh -huh. the uh, California University that all the they, they all, all went to after high school, Brenda got Brenda Walsh got the got the part, and everybody, even Brandon and and Kelly and everybody, were convinced that she had slept with this Roy Robinson. Which, frankly, did you see the dude? Could you blame her if she did? That guy, yeah, looks a bit of all right. But yeah, they all thought that she slept with him to get the part, but she didn't. She actually earned it. So he had a little run. And so when I first saw him, I was just like, is that? Is that, is that Roy Randolph? <laughs> oh my God. Yes, it is. And yes, that was an immediate trigger for me. I love 90210. I'll let you continue with your thoughts. I've never pegged you for a 90210 kind of guy, but hey, to each their own. <laughs> their uh, next podcast. <laughs> I, I'll be, if, if I could summarize uh, Marcus Cole, I think is, is the character's name. Um, this guy looks like what Vigo Mortensen based uh, Aragon on or Aragorn, whatever his name is from Lord. Like when he did the Lord of the Rings, like five years after this show came out, this is like the character he based him on. It, it's like this dude could have been his like body stand in while they were filming Lord of the Rings. Totally. <laughs> just, totally. He's, that's just totally as the vibe. They're both Rangers. It's just the vibe he gives off, but you know, I enjoy this. I, I said a while ago, I remember, oh, it was the season two premiere, Jeff, uh, when the show opens up on the Agamemnon, uh, uh Sheridan's old ship. Mm -hmm. And I, I said on the Brent watches episode then, and, and I'll say, you know, if there's something that I've learned about sci-fi, it's when a, a based or a station based crew gets a ship things tend to start getting really, really good. Mm -hmm. well, that's not what happened last season. I got really excited. That would be it. If this white star is going to hang around and this is the ship they now go use to do some stuff, which it sounds like it's going to be like buckle in. This ship looks dope. Yeah. It's got artificial gravity, which, which none other earth force ship has. They got to still do the spinny thing. It's got, uh, it's got, it can make its own jump point, even though it's really small. It apparently has like supercharged weapons. It's it's probably got like a, a souped up turbo engine in it as well. It's got its own like staff of people. Like, you know, they'll learn our language. Like, I, I, I'm going to wait for that episode. That's probably like episode 15 in season three where they start talking to Sheridan in Ivana. Yeah. Like, like somebody's saying something and they're talking about them. They like just chime in or they're like, Oh, you understood what we just said. <laughs> like, it's going to be that sort of a deal. And they're like, well, we were watching your lips move and yeah. we learned your language. So here we are. Cause we're we really learned, smart. We learned your language just about as fast as it took Ivanova to learn how to use the ship's systems. Right. Right. Well, you know, all she had to do was just watch the videos of the people, yeah. you know, <laughs> just gal galaxy movements. quest, the whole thing. I, I did like too how they, uh, Sheridan's blown away with the white star. This thing's amazing. What else mm -hmm. can this ship do? And Delenn's like, all in good time, which yeah. I read as being, we'll let you know as the plot demands it. <laughs> <laughs> We're not sure yet, but we'll tell right. you as the show goes on. Um, 
I loved, I loved Londo doing exactly what I said. It is time for him to break it off with the shadows. Londo is still bad. Yeah. He is, he is still, I have a new theory about Londo, Jeff. Okay. That I need to save every Star Trek reference that I have for. Wow. Okay. Uh, but we'll, maybe not all of them, but uh, don't let me get out of here without asking you about that. I, I think it's super clear and we just need to have that conversation at this point. Um, I loved the whole thing where they carried over seeing the, the ship and going, what is it? What is it? And that this guy was just sent out. That was a Senator. I didn't get that. That was a Senator. I actually, you know who I thought that was at first, the girl, I thought she was the president until at some point I was reminded, Oh no, no. President Clark is the president. Oh. <laughs> like I forgot about president Clark. I was like, Oh, she's the president of earth now. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, Morden's there. And the Psychops are there. I have a new theory about Psychor and what they're doing. And we'll talk about that. Like, I'm, I just enjoyed, this is what the episode need. like, this is what I was looking for. It doesn't have to be bang, 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 every single episode. It doesn't even have to be move the plot super far forward every single episode, but just take those steps as we go through. And that's what this episode felt like it did. For me, those are my overall thoughts on the season opener. Jeff, how about you? Well, this is my favorite season opener so far, right? Midnight on the firing line, not a fantastic episode. Points of Departure was a great episode. It was really good, but it existed to show us who John Sheridan was. And that's cool. This was the first time when it's like, hey, we're making some really good TV here. And we've got a story that, that's rocking and rolling and we're going to keep letting it rock and roll. We're not going to do, cause I feel like what season two did, and here I am describing how I like this episode based on the issues I had with the beginning of the second season. But I think the comparison is so important because that first part of the second season was like, Hey, we got to introduce you to this new guy. And then mm, we're going to remind you of some things that we probably should have spent more time on in the first season, but we didn't for whatever reasons. So and now we're going to dwell on it for like six episodes when it should have been like two or three and keep going. This one literally was like you said, we're just going to keep going. Things are established. Things are, are moving. Nothing was jarring. It just felt like the natural progression. But what I did like about this one, I, this didn't, have the big bang bang of a season opener, but this had a cinematic feel this episode did that I haven't experienced yet. Some of it might've been lighting a little bit here and there, but I think the pacing and the way that they moved the episode out, it felt longer than 43 minutes, but not in, not in the way of like, Oh my God, is this episode over yet? Like in the way of like, how are we only 20 minutes in? There's so much that's going on at a comfortable pace through this. I thought, I thought this was really good, but I did think it was pretty funny how on three different occasions they used the same transition to move the plot. And that was, Hey, can we go talk somewhere private? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like in Dawi, I, we have to go somewhere private for your ears only. And then Marcus was like, Hey, I'm going to send you my little pendant so we can meet somewhere private. So I can then ask you to go somewhere private <laughs> so we can have this conversation. Well, no, they needed to meet up with that, uh, airplane mechanic from Raiders of the lost Ark. I know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Back him into the jet. Right. I, I kind I, I really want to hear about your Londo thing. So let's talk, let's just talk about the whole yeah. breakup. Let's, let's go through and talk about the breakup. Okay. I, I mean, again, this was written in the tea leaves, you know, Londo, Londo's been real squeamish about what's going on with the, the shadows, um, for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I still say Londo's gone full on bad guy. Like regardless of how squeamish he is, he, he used these guys knowing, knowing full well what they would do. Like the first time I could almost forgive him because he didn't exactly know what they were going to do. Yeah. He knew what they were going to do. In, in, in taking the Narn home world and how that was going to go down. And he said, okay, one last time, let's do it. And he did it. And as much as it bothered him, he's still guilty. And he has all that blood on his hands. And we talked about this in the recap. It completely rewrites that geometry of shadows episode from season three, mm -hmm. where dude's like, I hear billions crying out and they're your victims. And you're like, oh, that's what he was talking. Yeah. About. Okay, cool. Not just a throwaway conversation. 
all that to say, it, this is the first time I feel like I've seen classic Londo in an entire season. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't see this at all in season two, not once. This was when he's in that spot where he's like, it's time for us to, you know, to say goodbye. And, and he's like, oh, one more thing. You know, we've got some bookkeeping we got to take care of. And he, and he goes, fine, I'll meet you in an hour and then you'll go away. And I'm like, yes, like that's the Londo that I want to play in the reboot of Babylon 5. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, yes, that's, that's the man. They go through, they're like, hey, we're, we need, you know, we're going to take out this Zagra 7. I'm a little confused about what his whole thing is with Lord Rifa because, like, in a spot, in a little bit, it kind of seems like he's like, oh, you want to disassociate yourself from us? Fine, but we're going to still hang out with Lord Rifa and uh -huh. be associated with the Centauri. He's totally dating the sister. That's all it is. Oh, we're breaking up. That's fine because. I'm just going to go talk to them and I'm, I'll go around you and you'll lose your status or you'll whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there was the other side of like, listen, you stay on your side of the line. We'll stay on our side of the line, but we need this one little piece that happens to be on your side of the line, which I don't understand why they just didn't draw the line. A little, a little hook, <laughs> a little loop, like just do that. Um, but I, I clearly that particular world, it was just about getting the, rangers off of that world mm -hmm. which i'm just now putting this together in my mind as i'm talking about this delenn keeps saying the shadows don't need to know that we know that they're coming so we can assemble our forces and they're actively pursuing a training base of their forces yeah they, they totally know they totally so they know. absolutely know what's happening uh but also or, i think i i got some hints in this one that the rangers aren't this new idea and they're not really quite as secret as i think we were led to believe they are like there are multiple training facilities mm -hmm. the minbari negotiated with other governments to find a place to put their training facility so like these are real high level conversations happening about special forces training camps marcus's brother joined and it was like come and join the rangers just like me no i'm gonna go work on a mine and then he died in some mystery shadow attack that we've never heard of was it a narn mine that he was working at or have the shadows attacked other places mm -hmm. but i just really got this feeling like the rangers are this thing that's been around for a long time maybe they just added the human element or they added the something else but so for the shadows it'd literally be like I don't know, some other country scouting up the United States and being like, oh, they've got Navy SEALs. Mm, look at that. Yep. We've had them for a long time. Well, and I mean, there's also the the, the story that Marcus told Ivanova uh, on the ship of like where he came from. He's like, well, my brothers were, my brother was doing this for a long time and he uh -huh. died in this particular attack or whatever. So there's clearly been a skirmishes and attacks and things like Stop. that that have happened between the Rangers and the Shadows. So yeah, they obviously know something anyway, we'll talk about all that. But the thing that really sticks out to me about Londo is, is, uh, the, when what's his name in Dowie and Dowie. Yeah. And Dowie, uh, he comes to talk to him and he, he talks about his vision. Okay. Which one time out on that. We've heard a lot about Londo's visions. Mm-hmm. What is Londo a telepath or is he a, a soothsayer, a, a future seer are all Centauri future seers? Like, well, I think this was, I think like, what's the deal in, with Londo specifically on this? I think it was either the gathering or midnight on the firing line. I forget which one, but they kind of covered every Centauri sees their death. I think they, okay. and so he's seen the sequence of events that lead to his death. But what we learned in signs and portents from Lady Ladira was mm -hmm. that they see possible futures. So they see their possible death. Because to me, we do hear about the vision a lot. We hear about the, you know him and Jacquard strangling each other to death. But we also hear about the hand coming out of the sky. Yeah, and, and all these other about, pieces. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think if I know I'm going to die with this dude strangling me, dude, I'm going to be a superhero and be able to do anything because I know I'm not going to die until this happens unless that's just what my current path is that I'm going to die on. 
So I, I think every Centauri has a piece of that kind of yeah. future scene, at least just to them and their end. Right. But I feel like Londo is more than that. Like as lady Ladiro was more than just, I can sort of see my death uh, and the path that that's on. Like she could feel the vibration. She could sense. Do you think stuff? Cause now we know Ivanova is a telepath. Yeah. And we have indication. Maybe possibly Londo is too. You might not get the reference. Somebody will. Is this Knights of the Old Republic 2 where all the party members can be trained as Jedi? Is that what this is? Like they're all telepaths and that's the end that we learn? I like to think that we're all uh, latent Jedi. Yeah. So I floated, I floated a whole thing that that all all muggles are still latent wizards. And with the proper proper stuff that can be pulled out. Anyway, that's a whole different situation. Get back to Londo. So he has this vision of the ships flying over Alpha Centauri or Centauri Prime or whatever he's called. And they're just blackening the sky. And Jeff, I, I don't know about you. I could think of nothing else but the scenes where we saw on Cardassia Prime, mm -hmm. the Dominion ships flying over. Yeah. And I'm like, that's the same same situation is what that looks like you know mm -hmm. you have this if you compare the the shadows to the dominion from this other world across the wormhole whatever out of hyperspace they're coming in to basically take over they're sending their people they're going to flood the area their home base is on that planet right over there that they have formed an unholy alliance with them as the cardassians did with the dominion as the centauri now have with the shadows Oh, wait, apparently Earth has two. More on that later. Here's the question. I don't know if this is under the same reference or if this is a new reference altogether. Is Londo the Gold Ducat of this show? Is Londo the guy who is... He is the villain, but at times he's a sympathetic villain that you see some hope for and you're like, wow, this guy actually, he could be a good guy. Like he could have some good parts to him. And I kind of see where he's coming from. I kind of feel for him, but no, he's just a villain and he's made his bed and he's going to have to lie in it. Now, obviously those paths are different and probably where they wind up is different. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe this winds up with the death of Londo and that's I how the story ends. I, I want, and we, I mean, we, we've said it just a week ago that Londo is irredeemable at this point, but I, I still like, I'm still Luke Skywalker, you know, hoping to see that little bit of good. I think that maybe he's the Damar of the Centauri, right? Who okay. ju just doing his job gets yep. full on evil, does this and then realizes, Oh no, that's the hopeful part of me. Well, Damar also was a drunk. So yeah. Yeah. Lines you know. up. And a lot of times he, you know, it was said uh, that, that uh, Casey Biggs, the guy who played Damar in Deep Space Nine, talks about how Damar's drinking was just because he had a guilty conscience. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because he was actually like addicted. It was just what he did to numb the the conscience. The, the actually, the conscience. Yeah, I, I didn't do this math till just now, but I had a note that there was a scene with him and Indo Londo and Indawi when he was mm -hmm. asking about stuff and. Oh, you know, welcome. Can I get you a drink? Can I? Oh, no, mm -hmm. I'm on duty. Oh, joy is a duty to the Centauri. That's we have to enjoy it and do it. But now, like, Londo's always drank and he used to drink other people's drinks, you know, mm -hmm. when he was at the bar. But now he's even day drinking while he's at work, while he's negotiating. I thought to myself, like, oh my gosh, like he's looking for excuses to numb the pain. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, I, Damar is probably a much better example what? at this point from what yeah. from the information we have it depends than on a where it goes. Yeah. and i think i think the other piece to that to write on the same reference is the dominion ultimately used cardassia and had no intention of actually elevating them to mm -hmm. equal footing and that's you know that's what led to the resistance and and them ultimately winning when morden and londo are going over the custody paperwork essentially he makes that comment that uh Hey, we both know what promises and treaties mean. That's a big statement right there. And so yeah. to me, I was like, does, is this foreshadowing 
for shadowing the shadows turning on the centauri absolutely i think yep. 100 i that had that as a note here 100 percent, the shadow are turning on the centauri and i think londo even sees it now yeah mm -hmm. i think he understands that possibility and you got Rifa over here still you know dancing with him and that's kind of that big tentacle energy that morden brings to the table <laughs> <laughs> where I it literally reference yep <laughs> Cause I think, cause you asked like, why, why bother going through the PowerPoint of you get this, you get that. If you're already yeah. in bed with Lord Rifa, here's why. Cause he's literally showing Londo, look what we're about to do to you. Go ahead and carve this out. We're going to take this right next to you and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's my big, uh, that's my big Londo. That's, that's, I think the, the glasses I'm viewing Londo through right now. Yeah, no, it makes is, a lot of sense. I was I was thinking gold to cut. I really like Damar. I think that's a far better example because Damar still was a hundred percent about the furtherance and the domination of the Cardassians. Mm -hmm. And Londo is a hundred percent about the furtherance and the domination of the Centauri. And you know, maybe rightly so, like it's his people. Yeah. Right? Maybe rightly so. But that's his deal. And uh, I was pretty surprised at how open he was about his vision within Dawi. Like, yeah, that was just a, like, I, mean, like <laughs> I feel like if some random special intelligence person showed up at my apartment and asked me about a thing I saw in my dream, I, pr I probably wouldn't be the first thing out of my mouth. But then you have to ask yourself, why? Why would Londo be so open with it other than reminding us as the viewer of his vision? I feel like maybe it was a cry for help. Like he's telling, Hey, here's somebody that I've got a treaty with a bit of an alliance. And I can tell you, I've seen this thing. Do you have anything for me? Any help? Any, anything? I don't know. I feel like for me, season three is going to be a lot of digging for hopes of redemption for Londo. Cause you're right. We got to see that glimpse of regular Londo again. And I, hmm. I miss him. Yes. Londo, I mean, I, I miss Londo and Jakar, two guys in a room talking yeah. who utterly hate each other, barbing back and forth. It was golden TV. And these two have been separated for an entire season. It's been painful. It really like the closest yes. we got was in now for a word when they were in different places saying the same things, you know, but, mm -hmm. and, and they still like, they still, that relationship transcended that and was awesome, but it's right. like, that's the only bit we got. It makes you wonder what the actors, uh, Andreas and Peter, uh, who clearly had such a chemistry and you're like, these two guys go out to dinner every Friday night together. And like they're bringing wives home to each other's houses, you know, for, for dinners and whatnot. And, and like, these guys are just gold together. What was that like for them going through season two, where honestly they weren't even on the call sheet together most of the time. Exactly. You know, had to be hard. So, right. So that's my, that's my whole thing with, uh, with Londo. Um, He's not last, last time I'll say he's not going to get out of this so easily though. No, no, there's, there's not going to get out of this so easily. Do you want to talk? Do you want to talk about the ending? Yeah. While we're still talking about the shadows yeah. because the, I mean the big reveal, big reveal of this episode, the shadows are on earth having formed an alliance with earth who, by the way, has also formed an alliance with uh, Centauri, mm -hmm. which we know that they were talking about it in the last couple of episodes from season two, we get confirmation that treaty has been signed and is now fully in place. Um, but Psycop is there. Morden is there. Earth force Senator is there in the capital of the world, which is in Geneva. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm not, I'm not appalled. I'm just, did we know this before this moment? The we now Geneva, know it. the Geneva yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. That came, I think, I think I knew that for sure in, and now for a word. Okay. I think cool. is when I wasn't yeah. too far ago, too far along then. Yeah. Um, yeah, there were a couple things that stood out to me here. One, like yeah. the fact, so that she's like, Oh, only the Narn 
the Narns are the only one that, that know anything about you. And Morden's like, yeah, and it looks like we solved that problem. It's almost like all of this war and all this death and destruction was literally to silence the one group that could speak out against them. That's a fair point I hadn't thought about. Because the, the Narn have the Book of Jaquan. Mm-hmm. They have the history here that was written down and, ha, you know, like, like, uh, uh, Jakar said it, the book of Jaquan is painstakingly copied every line, every tittle, every slash, every ink drop that got spilled while they were moving the deal. Like it is, it is precisely copied. From the original book of Jacon, which by the way, I need the prequel. I want, I want that's if we don't get uh Babylon 5 the reboot, I want right. I want the Jaquan story, like the original before you know, because because Jakar says like before we went to the stars, set it on Narn. You know, the they're not spacefaring yet, and the shadows come out and he leads this big revolt and well, it sounds like they had, very, leader and, they had very okay. little to do with the shadows. He's like, yeah, we didn't engage with them. They didn't, they didn't bother with us. They were fighting yeah. some war somewhere else. They just used our Southern continent, which also, oh my God, one of the, so they went and they took the Narn home world. Mm-hmm. Now it's a Centauri thing. Are the shadows reestablishing on that Southern continent? Are like, did are they leave they? something behind on the Southern continent that they can just like, Hey, let's go turn that base back on. Yeah. Go back and do that. And I, and I go back to, Oh, I can't remember the episode, but we talked about it in, um, confessions and lamentations, how the Mark had mirrored, like they had memories of Jakar's story and the Narn story. Did they have a base on the Mark home homeworld? And somehow the disease is tight. Like, was that their bio warfare thing? And now they've cleared out the Mark so they can have a base on Mark they have their base on Zaha Doom. They have their base on Narn. Like they're totally reestablishing themselves. And now a base on Earth. Mm-hmm. They're coming in for a base on Earth. You know, the other thing on the Earth thing I thought was fascinating. And it's just one little quick thing where the Psycop says, because Morton's like, hey, this is just, you know, we can just say it's a rumor thing, whatever, brush it out of the carpet. And the Psycop's like, well, I don't know. People are pretty freaked out. I feel like we could use this for our program to Morton- accelerate. The program. Yeah. Which speed up the program. He's the program, like whatever that is. But Morden says, interesting. Yeah. And then moves on. I feel like, and then I, I know you've got more to talk about on the program, so I'll let you go there. But I feel like we had that one episode with the Lumati who thought humans are so great because look how terribly you treat your poor. Now we have the shadows, one of the most ancient evils to ever exist. And they're impressed at the evil and the conniving and the conspiracy weaving that the Psychor is doing. He's like, Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Look how debased humanity is. <laughs> so, uh, two thoughts. One, we've been talking about there being these different fronts of enemies, right? There's the shadows. That's the big, the big bad guy, but there's also home guard. There's also Psychor. And there's also whatever President Clark is into, which we are tying to Home Guard more than we are Psychor. There's the uprising on Mars, right? Mm-hmm. The Ministry of Peace. That's the new one that's come in. Yep. Right? What if they are all in league with each other and they're actually the same threat? Oh, yeah. That totally makes sense. That's, I mean, that's that's what we got out of this episode, mm-hmm. right? It's all orchestrated. It's, it's all one thing. Mm-hmm. Shadows and Psychor and ultimately probably shadows. Well, Unless they're certainly Psychor. directing the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. So what is the program? You got your red yarn? Okay, let's do it. Let's let's try. Hey, listen, folks out there listening, you guys out there watching in YouTube land. This is one of my one of my things. So you guys are either gonna laugh at me or you're gonna pee your pants as far as how close I am. Don't tell me either way. Just laugh or pee your pants. Um, so here we go. We know Psychor is wanting to breed telepaths, right? 
we know that Psycor is wanting to make them stronger. They're wanting to get them so high and and whatever, right? Now, I thought, I floated the idea, what if it's to get them ascended to become shadows uh-huh. or something of that nature, right? What is this program they talk about uh, doing this? And And I started thinking and I went, well, what if actually what they're trying to do is do what is going on with the human Mimbari souls? Because we talked about how the human Mimbari souls, like humans are starting to be inhabited by these Mimbari souls that are disappearing, right? And I thought for a moment, I don't think this is the case. What if the telepaths are the humans who have been embodied with the Mimbari souls? Hmm. I don't think that's the case, right? But what if there is this deal? Basically, what they're doing is they're trying to get humanity to a spot via the Psychor that they can receive these shadow ghost figures. Because remember, we saw Morden talking to the ghost yeah. things. What if they can attach themselves to the people? And it's about getting them to basically be these super soldiers that they can then download their consciousness into. Right? Mm-hmm. You know, you, you like you, you smell what I'm cooking here? Yeah. That the whole Psycor program, this program we talked to, we could use this to accelerate the program. We've got it. We can't let any latent telepath get out there. We've got to collect them all because we've got to, we've got to build up this base for the shadows to come in and take over their bodies in order to wage war and finally win this, this decisive battle and, and set ourselves up as the gods of the, of the universe. And think about it from the human, from the human standpoint, right? Or from, uh, you know, I hate to say human because it's human. I don't want the humans to be the bad guys, yeah. but what's one way we can just go dominate the entire universe out there by teaming up with these guys. Yeah. And we're going to merge forces and, and in doing so we get to go rule the whole dang galaxy. I, I personally don't care to rule an entire galaxy. That just seems like a lot of work, <laughs> you know? but it sounds, seems like something a psychor would want to sure. do. Yeah. So, that's my that's my uh that's my thought right now trying to piece what they are all doing together and i really wonder if psychor is trying to develop bodies for the shadows to come and inhabit it really feels it really feels like in sci-fi a lot of times we talk about what's humanity's role you know what Mm -hmm. does humanity bring and delenn has talked about that you know they have the capacity to be the greatest of us. But if you have the capacity to be, to be the greatest, you also have the capacity to be the worst. And so yep. maybe we're like this, I don't know if genetic is the right word, but we're this some sort of, um, I don't know, thing that can connect with the Minbari and become like a force for good and light as a Minbari, thing. or we can connect with the shadows and become a force for bad and evil. It Here I go. It or connect me. with the Vorlons. Yep. I was going to, so I was going to say, right. How, so the Vorlons are the perfect question for where, how do they reproduce or do they, do they reproduce by essentially subsuming some other species that they've, I don't know, maybe spent an entire millennia building them up to believe that there's some sort of a, you know, Oh, I can strain myself. So everyone sees me as an angel or a God or a holy being so that when I do show up, I can just, you know, kind of Jeff, how much, how much of human history of, of religious history. And I'm not just speaking of one religion. Think of all the religions throughout human history have dealt particularly Greek and Roman have dealt with the gods mating with humans and having offspring, right? It's It's Hercules. That's it's wonder woman. It's It's Maui. (laughs) Yeah, it's <laughs> right? these are all the stories it's we Wonder still Woman, tell. Yeah, Wonder Woman, yeah. Right? and so it, so I think that's a great example. I think another one is in Mass Effect, where the Reaper. That's always Mass Effect for me. But the Reapers actually they they consume the the races to create more of them. You know that's how they mm-hmm. reproduce. And I think that I think you're you're onto something. And humanity is that magic key 
that anything can match up to, whether it's a Minbari soul, a Vorlon or a first one, or the ancient ones or the shadows can utilize humanity to be the next version of them. And so it's not just the prophecy of the darkness and the light coming together or whatever it was. Like the Minbari prophecy is literally the battle happens in the human soul. That's mm -hmm. where that's that's the final battlefield is is humanity, our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Jeff, if that's where we're going, I mean, this is a Star Trek message through all the through. way through. I yeah. mean, that's it. Like it's the battle for for the best of us. It's the mm -hmm. battle for who we are. Like, my gosh, like this is this is this is where new trek i think is going in in a lot of cases mm -hmm. <laughs> totally <laughs> you know? yeah you know? um yeah so that's what we got man that's that's the shadows and earth connection now yeah it's big you want to talk about the new guy yeah let's talk about the new guy and the rangers we learned a the lot rangers, about them. so we learned a lot yeah learned a lot about the rangers ivanova already knew everything about the rangers which was awesome of course she does like <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that was such a great scene. She's like, of course I know these things. It's my job to know these things. So I know them. Right. And the day that I don't know something, that's when you should worry. Like but I just know everything. It does so make me question. question though. Oh yeah. Did Sinclair contact her and we just didn't see it? Oh, that would have been cool. Or was she just in CNC when those messages were being relayed and she was just like, Hey, what are you watching right now? Oh, Hey, it's my dude. That was my question is, if she could piece it together, who else is piecing it? And, and does that person who can piece it together, get paid 50 credits a week to wear a night watch armband. Oh yeah. That could blow up. Yes. Yes. Um, so new guy comes in. All right. Let's, let's just, let's place an over under, uh, Keffer was at six episodes. He was in the opening credits forced upon them by the studio. I don't know that Marcus Cole was forced upon them by the studio. I don't know what his deal is. Folks, I don't really care right now. We'll talk yeah. about that much later. Um, over under on Marcus Cole, number of episodes that he is in. I'm going to set that number. Let's hear Keffer was at six. I'm going to set the number at nine. Are you taking the over? Are you taking the under? That's pretty low. Up. Yeah, I'll take the under though. Oh, you are? Yeah. Oh, and I'm totally taking the over. I don't so. think that he got signed to a fifty for a fifty percent deal. I doubt he's even getting paid for eleven episodes. You don't think so? I don't think so. Even though he's in the opening credits now. Natoth was in the opening credits last season and she was in it twice. That's fair. Yeah, that I don't put a lot fair. of stock in the opening credit. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, okay, so these yeah. are people that got a, a set deal. They're getting paid for six, yeah. for nine, for 11, for yeah. 12. Yeah. I was I was also going to say, I happen to know that Marcus Cole has an action figure. Yeah. That I now have. Um, but Natoth does as well. So. Oh. Um, yeah. I do. So you, you take the under. You, you're I'm, taking well, the under. To be Jeff, clear, I'm taking the under for, for this season. Yeah, I yeah, think, yeah, that's yeah, I mean, I think he's going to last. Yeah. I think, I think we will see him through the end. I think he's a long term for us. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'll even, I'll even take that. Jeff, we need to revisit this. Like, I don't know where we put notes for the season recap, which is in six months from now, <laughs> but we need to revisit how many episodes Marcus Cole is in, in this, in this season. We could start uh, the note. Normally we start the note two weeks ahead of time. Maybe we could be a little ahead of it this time around. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to place the over under at nine and, uh, I'm going to take the over. You're going to take the under. Yeah. I do works. think, I think he's going to show up more than we think he's going to, you know, um, is it more than a, let's hear it's 22. Is it more than 11 episodes in a season? I don't know. Uh, that's why I'm kind of giving it a little buffer there. So yeah, that's fair, but I like this guy. Like, you know, we, we've talked about him, but he's, he is a bad a fighter dude he he pulls out that stick and it goes choom, choom on each side of it and delan apparently has one as well or he gave yeah. her his or that whole something. scene was great i mean the fight we've, scene? That's we've the yeah. best fight scene i've seen in in babylon 5 totally lanier we've seen him in action before delan holy crud and then you add in marcus and those those poor 
this poor guy's in never. I mean, that was awesome. And you knew as soon as you stood up to him, you're just like, oh, dude, this is not going to end well for you. <laughs> what did he, what did he say to him? He's like, uh, he's like, I don't like being disappointed or made fun of or something. He's like, funny with somebody who looks like you, I thought you'd be used to it. <laughs> Whatever it was he said, you're like, dude, you're about to kick his butt. Yeah. You know, it's about to happen. Uh, Delin can fight too, man. Like she's, she's no joke either. She's not somebody to be trifled with either. Yeah. They did a great job blocking the shots too. You got a lot of face, you know, like a, mm-hmm. of, of, of Delenn throwing kicks and doing things. I wonder if mm-hmm. Mira Furlan has some, you know, stunt background or anything. Cause she right. was doing stuff that was really, really well done. Did we know about the jewel? Like, have we seen that more that that's a marker for the, for the Rangers? what do you think about the jewel and the story that Marcus told about the jewel? I thought it was a neat story, but I also liked Marcus's reaction to the story. You know, Dylan's like, do you believe that? And he's like, I don't believe in miracles anymore. I've been around too long. Mm. You liked that reaction because it's a philosophy you personally ascribe to, or you just like the fact that he had that as his reaction. It's the same reaction I had to it. Really. It's like, oh, that's okay. a great story that you quench the you know the fire in these different things cool oh and this happens when a ranger dies all right that's a great story maybe it motivates some of you for me it's just a neat story there's probably a shop on minbar pumping them out you can buy them on the 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 zocalo store (laughs) or not but maybe you can. All I know is there are multiple ranger training facilities, which was mind blowing to me. Like when that, we st- and they weren't and they weren't just on Babylon Five. Yeah, the idea was, that there was rangers not on Babylon Five was blowing my mind. Really? So I feel yeah. like when Sinclair introduced them, we knew there were some on Babylon Five, and we knew there were some out about. Like they were his eyes mm-hmm. and his ears out and about. But I got the impression that they were like a real quiet, like ninja group that nobody knew about and pretty mm-hmm. small. And we're working on, you know, we're working on working together, you know, we're, we're holding, holding trust meetings and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But then they're like, Oh, we got a training facility on Minbar. We got one on this Zagro seven that the Drazi are like actively involved with helping us with. How many of these things are there? How many, I mean, I don't know. I just, I totally thought the Rangers were this little little thing that we're going to become, mm-hmm. you know, small, but mighty, but apparently they're all over the place. And, well, and I mean, and I thought it was all Sheridan, or not Sheridan, Sinclair. Mm-hmm. He like, he was the guy who started them all and he's got this ro- running and, and he's working to get all the, and who knows what Sinclair is actually up to. We know he's out there somewhere doing something, right? Yeah. But who, I mean, who yeah, he's really on Minbar knows? leading the stuff. And the thing is like, if Marcus's brother was a ranger way back and got killed in some attack. That Sinclair episode was like six months ago in the timeline yeah. of Babylon five. That's not time for dude to die. You to get trained as a ranger. Come on. What so what more is there? Do you get the idea that his brother was a better fighter than he is? Cause this guy's pretty good. Like, well, the, not only that might be better than bigger brother. Just be honest with you. But he's got that whole thing too. Where like, I don't know if he like, like died, you know, he shut off life support so he can live on next to zero you know, air or whatever. And then as soon as Franklin turns his back, he does the smartest thing any patient of Franklin's can do. And that is get the hell out of med bay or med lab. Yeah. Cause Franklin <laughs> might try to kiss you. Yeah. Or kill you. One of the two, like <laughs> it's not going to be a good ending <laughs> or save your life when you don't want it to be. Yeah. He'll force his way on you. Whatever he thinks is best one way or the other, or I'll put you on a diet. Um, so that scene, by the way, I totally thought Franklin was going to get shanked. Same. Totally. You know, like they were setting that up. They were blocking it. The camera was like, Franklin's about to go down. Jeff, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't disappointed that he didn't. I was actually mad that he was calling for help. Like he calls up, I need Jeff here. Oh, is it urgent? Nah, like this, this, this thing's just literally beneath me and I need someone else to handle it. Cause I'm better than dealing with this. And so as I was, I'm like, come on, just yank him around the throat. Just knock him down. <laughs> To be fair, I think he was just busy moving into his new digs and he was just assigning the thing to somebody else. Did Medlab so get destroyed last week? Like, no, I think we just got some more money between season two and season three and they built a new set. Okay. Yeah. I kept That's saying, I'm like, I'm like, why? Got the why one line it? of like, yeah, this place is better than the last one. Okay, cool. All right. Great. What happened to the old one? 
We'll probably never maybe it find did. Out. Maybe it did get destroyed in the the uh, the Centauri attack. That's the only thing that I is, can think that of. That is entirely possible. Hey, by the way, so a week ago, they've already fixed the fin on the outside that got blown off. They're they're clearly still cleaning up some parts of the station, but mostly everything's back to where it's supposed to be. Yeah, for a pretty for good a, repairs process for a station that a year ago was having strikes and union and labor issues and everything. They are a well-oiled machine at this point. Well, and I mean, budget issues and yeah. resource, you know, getting resources and stuff like they just have an extra fin that they can go replace up there. Yeah. Like did they duct tape it back together. Like what'd they do? Well, maybe they got some extra money from the men, the Minbari. Cause I mean, apparently they have so much money. They can go and develop an entire like experimental spaceship thing. And you know, great council and everybody doesn't even know that it's happening. Mm, that's not what they said. That's not, not everybody. what Dylan said. She said not everybody on the Great Council knows, which means some do. So what does this tell us about the Great Council? There's a division in the council, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I want to hear what's. I want to hear more about that because we've we've tracked this right. There, there's a uh, an imbalance of power in the Great Council now. Some people within the Great Council came. I mean, I, I'm going to go back to dude from the Great Council came and gave uh, Delenn the the triluminary that helped mm-hmm. her build the cocoon or the chrysalis or whatever you want to call it, so that she could turn into a butterfly with hair. Yep. Yeah. But yeah. then, but then at the same time, the Great Council yelled at her and chastised her for and turning her into out. a butterfly with with human yeah. hair. Yeah. Right. Um. So there's something going on. There and we are, and we heard old draw say that you know he, he doesn't recognize Mimbar anymore. Stuff's going on in Mimbar, like what what the heck's going on? So there's stuff happening on Mimbar they're not exploring yet in the show, but and they I keep, really need them to. Explore. They keep dropping these little pieces because I, like that was my big thought on the whole. I'm like that ship must have cost a fortune to build. Mm. How do you not see that? You know how because do you not? It, because the Mimbari are a post scarcity society who don't actually deal with money unless they're dealing with outside forces. It's possible. I mean, after all, they've had artificial gravity for some time. Right, two or three. That's, That's my third. No, it's actually it's your two. two. Cause the other one you got to ride for quite a while. I think we both let me ride it. Left. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. cool. But I do think that just, just straight up calling it the white star. This uh-huh. is where it's all going to come to a head is Naroon is going to hear that name. And he is going to lose his freaking mind. That's such to me. That is such an in, like. I get it. They're trying to reconcile Starkiller Sheridan with now Ranger leader Sheridan. But to a dude like Naroon, that is not going to fly. No, but I love the connection you made there. The Black Star, the Star Killer. Now this is the White Star, and Sheridan's in control. He's going to turn into the White Knight. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, it acknowledges, just, it acknowledges that redemption that you and I've talked about. We're like the Minbari, Delenn specifically and her, her faction are like, you are redeemed now and you're going to do great things. Yeah. You did this horrible thing mm-hmm. to us in war where that's what you do, but like you're good now <laughs> where we were kicking your butts and you were fighting back, but you know, we're going to hold that against you. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, and don't forget there is something incredibly special about Sheridan himself, right? It was, yeah. this is what made Kosh get out of his suit and go rescue. It, if that had been anyone else, Kosh would have let that dude smash into obliterated pieces and Filch is going to have to go clean him up off the, off the hole, you know, like those CGI guys putting the tracks back together would have been having a little magic erasers oh absolutely as well. yeah, yeah they'd have been yeah they and they would have been just picking up little bits of whoever that person was well i think we saw so but, much of what makes sheridan special on the white star and it was the it was the comparison between him and delenn right so like they're on the bridge and delenn is freaking out oh my god it's the shadows we're not ready we can't do this and sheridan's like well we're gonna have to so let's do it and she's panicked losing her mind the whole time. And he's literally like, Hey, what's the craziest thing we can do here? And let's just make that happen. Like, whatever, let's get in. So you've got Delenn, who's like the reserved quiet. Oh, Mm -hmm. I'm a little nervous about on paper, on paper. There's no way we can win this fight. So let's not even do it. And Sheridan's like, 
yeah, you can always win, you know? Mm -hmm. In fact, a I'll use a rush quote. You can, um, you can fight, you can fight without ever winning, but you can never, ever win, win without a fight. It's from their song Resist. It's beautiful. 1995's uh, Test for Echo. 1996's Test for Echo. I loved Sheridan on board this starship. He was in his element, man. He was you said I it. You said I had one more. You have one more, yeah. Okay, Sheridan in command of the White Star after one episode is better than Cisco in command of the Defiant. He he was smart. He was strategic. He was a statistician. A a a a strategician. Strategist. Yep that that word right there. There you go. Um, when he sat back and 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 he's like, yeah, go to the nearest jump gate. We can form our own jump point. Yeah, but I don't want them to know that yet. And now we're going to be in the thing. Hey. We're going to form our own jump gate inside the open jump gate. And it's going to crush the shadow ship that we have no chance of destroying otherwise. Cool. What Let's even do, try that. When he even asked Lanier, he's like, hey, can this thing outrun like the blast from that thing? And Lanier's like, well, I don't know. Maybe it's but good enough for me. We're going to try it. it. Yeah. I love it. I, yeah. you know, it was just so great. By the way, Bill Mummy, I loved his acting at the very end of this episode where the, the whole thing happens and he's sitting there, like he's kind of out of breath and he's sitting down and like, are you okay? And he's like, you know, in training in temple, they didn't tell us that we could do this. And when I get back home, I'm going to make a few recommendations. And that moment right after he says it, where he just like, he, his eyes sort of like, this like, Oh boy, <laughs> like this, that whole acting moment. I was like, I could feel what he was feeling in that moment because of how he's doing it. It was so, so good. And I'm so glad that Lanier has become more than just the quiet, reserved little attache to the ambassador mm -hmm. that he is a fully involved member of this cast. Now, you, you know, he's not just the kid from lost in space. He is this guy. Hey, dove right in. Hey, they don't speak your language. I got you. Cool. Right. We're good. Yeah. Right. Which by the way, wait, did I say this already? I might've said this already. Like episode 15, like the, the people oh, on the ship are just yeah. going to be like, Hey, I know what you, I can talk your language now. No, we speak English now. It's yeah. cool. Like we watch, we watch the show. We learned it. <laughs> right. <laughs> at, at whatever point Bill mummy wasn't available for that particular episode. They now know how to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they get back from the, the white star, which I'm guessing is like often some undisclosed part of space with the religious people just keeping it floating around. I think it's just, I think it's just hiding somewhere. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's in the back cave of space. Yeah. You know, they've got a space for it out there. Ready at a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. They but just got to get to it. <laughs> they come in and then he Sheridan forms his war council. That's a cool thing. Mm -hmm. Now I, Okay. I know that happened in this episode, but I feel like that happened last season already as well. Really? Was there something similar to this from last season? Probably, like, probably when the he general brought, Hague thing, yeah, right? Yeah. So he brought the earth force people. That, so yeah, when you think about it and even when I was taking my notes, like the first thing I wrote was all the people who know about the shadows, the Rangers and the earth stuff. Yeah. He didn't say anything about the earth stuff. That's still yeah. his own little separate group. That's also a part of this group. Yeah. But I thought it was interesting. Like it's a great idea. I made the joke in the recap about, Hey, there are no ground rules mm -hmm. except this one rule. <laughs> I'm just like, dude, that is a, that's literally a ground. Okay. Whatever. I get it. I get it. You're creating a psychologically safe space in the nineties. That's advanced and great of you. Awesome. But he makes a comment or he says, this is made up of the people who are aware of the shadows and the Rangers. And I'm hoping to add more people eventually. Who are those other people? as they find out more humans that have Mimbari souls or Mimbari, I, I, that's an interesting group. Who are the Mimbari that are joining the Rangers? We saw a couple hanging out and was it comes the inquisitor or whatever when yeah. they hand, but, but yeah. nobody of note, like it's all no, but humans. like, but on Mimbar in this whole group, who are the, like mom, dad, I think I'm going to go join this Rangers group over here. Like, are they recruiting them out of high school out of temple? Like who are these guys? You know, are they, are they some resistance group on their world? Because we know not all's right on Mimbar. 
Exactly. You know? Jeff, you got anything else about this episode? I think we're ready. Let's turn it. So Brent, we've reached that part of the episode now where we boil it all down. We see if this show has any of that Star trek E quality to it, like a deep moral message, uh, holding up a mirror to society, giving us hope that we will or that we can be better in the future. We're going to do this with me rating this on a scale of zero to five deltas as to how, how Star trek E it is. I'm saying Star trek E because we don't want to say how Star Trek it is. It's just a label for all the cool things sci-fi does. And Brent, you're going to rate this on an episode of zero to five star theories as to how much we enjoyed the episode and how Babylon five, the episode was. So I'll go first on the deltas and I'll tell you when I first watched this episode, a couple things stood out to me, but it was hard to dig through them. It took my second watch through to really, really get to it, but there really was a star Trek message to it. And the two points that come to mind is Sheridan taking responsibility for the Rangers well-being. There's the scene where like, Hey, we got to go do this. We have a VIP on the station and we got to sneak behind him and go. And he says, when I assumed shared leadership of this group, I assumed responsibility for their well-being. that's leadership at its finest, right? An effective leader will always do what needs to be done to make sure that the people that they work with are taken care of. Now, this is how I, Jeff Aiken watches Star Trek, <laughs> right? I look for those leadership points, but to me, that's what Star Trek is about is creating better leaders to move us into that future. But if you're not a leadership nerd, like I am, the core message still applies and it pervades the whole episode. Take your responsibility seriously, right? Yeah. Do the things that you've committed to do, even if it jeopardizes you in your career, like share like imagine. Imagine if it wasn't cool, the cool dude, Ndawi, who was so cool and so reason, just a dude doing his job. He wasn't being a jerk like everybody else. But imagine if, like, imagine if Ben Zane was there or uh, Pierce, Captain Pierce was on there, or even Lawyer Natoth was there doing the thing. There would be hell to pay for him coming, but he still would have done it because that's what you do to take care of your people. There's another message. It's not as prevalent through the episode, but it's a line that Delenn says when they're talking about the shadow ship with Ndawi. And that's where she's saying the ships are indestructible. And Sheridan says, I don't believe that. Like every ship has a weakness. Like we can do this. And she says, believe what you will until experience changes your mind. What I thought was cool, it is in the storyline, is it changed her mind. She saw a shadow ship get destroyed. So you can read whatever you want. You can take whatever college classes you want, watch whatever YouTube videos, do whatever research on your own and learn about a thing. But until you do the thing, until you see the thing, you never truly actually know. And the flip side to that, the Star Trek message to it, that's more implied by me than anything is that we have to keep our mind open to those changes. When we see something that's against what we've learned through the book learning or whatever, we have to be open to questioning that because we saw something different. I think there's some really good messages in it, but while one of them kind of pervaded, the other one didn't, I'm going to give this one three deltas. I like it. I really like that message of take responsibility for what you've committed to. It, it seems uh, like if I could pinpoint that particular one, that's a next generation yeah. message, you know, very, very <laughs> like, much like so. all the way through. Right. Um, I, I like it. Okay. Let's talk about star furies. Then how Babylon five is this episode? Cause Babylon five is its own deal, right? Um, how much do we like this episode? I like this episode quite a bit. Am I going to look back on this episode and say, this is one of my favorite episodes of Babylon five ever. Is it one of my favorite episodes of the season? Probably not. This very much seemed to be just like, it's another episode but it moved everything ex like in the right ways in the right direction. Like it, there was nothing veiled at least as far as we could see, or if there was stuff that was veiled, there was also plenty of stuff that was clear and out front, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed this episode. This is an episode that I absolutely will watch every single time it comes on on a rewatch. I'm flipping through the channels. If I see this episode on, I'm stopping to watch and I'm not changing the channel until it gets to a commercial. And then I'm changing back as soon as I think three and a half minutes have passed. 
because I'm back to watching this episode. I'm watching this episode every single time. I like this episode really a lot. Um, it's not mind blowing, right? Uh, but it moves everything where it needs to go. So I'm going to give this one. Jeff, it's taken everything within me not to say five star. I know. I, I don't can... know that it's a five star fury uh, episode. So I'm going to say four. I think this is a solid four star fury episode. And I'm going to put a little asterisk because it could be more, but I don't. It, I'm, I'm trying to combat against recency bias. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, when I think about a fi the five star fury episodes that we've seen, they have been massive. Like they either had a, the like confessions and lamentations is a great example where it just had such a punch you in the face message. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh my gosh, this was huge. Or it was a big thing like the long twilight struggle where like, Oh my God, it was huge. I think five star theories is a, is a, is a high bar just as five deltas is a high bar. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yeah, this, this was a great great episode i loved mm -hmm. this episode i was so refreshed to talk about recency bias i was so yeah. refreshed to watch this episode but i think four star theories is really fair yeah. this one should not wind up in the top five of our ranking by the end of the season like i would hope there are other episodes that are so much better than this one well that's a you fun know? thing we get to do right now because uh just like last season we are creating the 100 percent absolutely accurate and definitive ranking of the third season of babylon 5. we did this in season one in the wrap-up we did it through the season in season two we're going to do the same here in season three it may not end as a top five episode but brent where do you place matters of honor in season three so far well out of 22 episodes this is the number one episode jeff it is it's the only one but it is the number one so i currently place it at number one and uh you know what this one doesn't do remember that episode last season was it the long dark or distant star and it was one of, one of those two that were like hey whatever other numbers there are like we'll leave the blank ones and then this one goes down at the bottom like this doesn't do that this is clearly a number one episode right now and uh that's where i'm gonna leave it and you can't fight me on it because that's how the game works. That's right. I cannot. It's your rank to put it there. And you know what? I, uh, I'm i very tempted to argue this one's strong. But, you know, yes. points of departure stayed in the top position for quite a while. I stayed in the top five for a lot longer than five weeks. That was a yeah. It's a good episode. I'm going to be interested to see how this one fares through the rest of the season. I, I think it's just going to depend on the quality of the other episodes around it. Yeah. You know, if this if this season goes like season two, and I'll be very upset if it does. Uh, but if it goes like season two, where remember we got to the end and we looked at it, half the season was not good and half the season was really good. Mm -hmm. I really hope that more than half the season is really good. I, I, I can forgive it if one or two episodes is a little, eh, but for the most part, I now expect to see everything really top notch. And let's think about where we are in the life of a show though, Jeff, right? Mm -hmm. We know from watching so much sci-fi watching so much Trek, watching so much Stargate and Battlestar Galactica. Season one is always rough. Season two is still rough, but usually better. And somewhere around season three, towards the middle, maybe at the end, maybe a little closer, this is where the show finds its footing. The characters know who they are. The writers know who the characters are. They've established everything they need to establish, and now they can just run with the show. They get new budgets. They get new costumes. That's where I feel like we have to be with this show right now. Like it's, it's normal life. So yeah, I'm excited for it. Well, that's it for matters of honor next week. We're going to be watching convictions for the next time. We've never seen these episodes, but we've never seen these episodes before. We haven't looked ahead. We haven't read any synopses. We haven't looked at thumbnails or anything. So based on the title alone, we like to guess what we think the episode is going to be about. So Brent, what do you think is going to happen next week on convictions? Hmm. So convictions, when you talk about convictions, you're talking about people sticking to their guns about something, right? It's a type of conviction. Yeah. Right. Right. I don't, I don't think this is like a, a judicial conviction. Uh, oh, it could be, I guess, but Return I'm going to say ombuds. this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think it's that. I think this is people sticking to their guns. I'm sensing a Franklin episode. 
as much as I hate to say it. Maybe Garibaldi, maybe Ivanova. Um, I do think it's it's one of our core human people. I think the ambassadors are missing from this one. Like Londo, Jakar, Kosh. Uh, Delenn may or may not be in. She's kind of Sheridan's girl right now, so she may pop up here and there, but I don't think she's the focus of the episode, even if she does show up in it. Um, so I'm leaning towards Franklin. You know, it could. Oh, I know what it is. I know exactly what it is, Jeff. Oh, no. Okay. The great egg people are back. Oh, God. That this is, is the episode. This is the episode. And here's what it is, Jeff. No, no, no. I'm going to combine it with the other side of convictions. Okay. This is why it's plural because it's not just one conviction, it's oh. convictions. Franklin has to deal with the fallout of what he did to that boy. Oh. And so maybe it's it's like new patients from the great egg people are on board and they've heard of him. And now he's like this big evil guy and they're afraid and he has to stand by his convictions. But people are like judging him or or maybe and I. Re oh, Jeff, I hope this is the episode. I hope that because I love shows that do this. Deep Space Nine did it. Stargate SG-1 did it. One of those shows that everybody does it. The government of the great egg people have shown up on Babylon 5 to extradite Franklin to stand trial for what he did to that boy. And Franklin has to stand by his conviction while they are trying to get a conviction. That's what this episode should be about. Sinclair comes back and he literally just comes back to say, yes, take him. And if you... <laughs> <laughs> I should have got this I'm guy okay fired. With a long Sheridan time ago. being like, I read that file. Yes, you got him. Go. He's yeah. done. You Sinclair should have fired this guy. Yeah. yeah. I want that to be the episode so bad. That's not all what I made the note here. I think it's going to be about I think I think we're going to get a sidekicks episode. Oh, cool. I'm I'm with that. I think it's going to come down to Veer is going to have to make a choice. He's going to this is where he's going to start like actively helping the Narn resistance. And he's going to be in a couple situations where he risks getting caught, but does it anyway, because he has, you know, uh, con convictions about stuff. Maybe we get some more of like his and Lanier's uh, drink dates where they're, where they're meeting up for quick, quick drinks. But Brent, we'll find out here next week. Mm -hmm. Thank you everybody so much for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to us. And if you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe as well. Also hit the bell. We will not flood your notifications. We'll make sure you're only getting the good stuff. And if you haven't already, please stop by Apple Podcasts, leave us a review, and we'll be more than happy to share it here on the podcast. So Brent, until next time. Hey, Jeff, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I don't know about you, but I'm getting really sick and tired of all of these people coming into our show and making all these demands in our comment feed. Dude, what's... Where's your sense of mystery, your sense of adventure? Are you, are, are you trying to cheer me up or something? What, what are you doing? Never, but I, would, I wouldn't even dream of doing that. Good, because I hate being cheered up. It's depressing. Then the peace and victory and long life. It's my first time. I like the peace, victory, and long life. I, I like that. That because we talked about like it's starting to blend, right? I, uh -huh. I like it. I yeah. like it. I like it. It's all part of our master plan to bring them together. All right, Club Sixty Five. What's up, y'all? Hey, does anybody have a T-shirt yet? I know. Just I want. Well, if they did, it'd be weird. I I don't think that ships that fast. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, it'd be cool. It'd be super cool if they did. Do you know what we're talking about Club Sixty Five when we say the T-shirt? You should. Jeff and I have t-shirts that we made just for you guys that you guys can go get, which is awesome. You can go to there this website right down there, bit.ly.com forward slash B5 club 65. Just get your exclusive t-shirt. We've put those up there at cost. So we're not even making money. This is just for you to have like, that's all it is. So, cause you're that cool. You guys are awesome. You guys are awesome. But with that, Jeff, we are at an hour and 40 minutes on this show. So yeah, I, I knew this one was going to go long. I had a lot it's of a notes season for premiere. I like, I was kind of feeling a little bad about it, but then I was like, it's the season. It's the season opener. It's fine.
Yeah. We had a new cast member we had to meet and we had a new ship we had to meet. Well, but we're rolling off of a two and a half hour one from last week. So this is really a vacation for everybody. This Sorry. is a short one. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Jeff, let's, let's, let's aim next week for like an hour and 15. Total. Right. I know. Right. Well, we'll see if it's a Franklin episode. It might be quick. Hey, he's the worst. Any other questions? Nope. We're good. All right. See you next <laughs> is he week. Dead yet? Is he still fired? How does he still have a job? Seriously. Much like several coaches in the NFL right now. Oh my. How did they, how did they not get fired on black Monday? Like seriously, I just, you know, they're, they're getting ready for owners meetings right now and all that sort of stuff. Draft is happening around the corner. Like, how? yeah. And you don't generally fire the coach right before or after the draft. Like that's kind not, of you know, usually you do that way before. Yeah. yeah. You're crewing the ship at that point. So that's why I just, I'm looking around the league right now and I'm like, how do you folks still have a job? Like there's at least four coaches right now that I can't believe still have a job. Yeah, it's pretty mind blowing. But you know, I mean, there's yeah. there's still I don't know what. Well, probably this week really is about uh, about it that they could do something. I mean, they could do something at any point, but you know. But are they? You're right. It, no, because because the the coaching candidates are done. You know, people people that would be available have already signed contracts in with their current staffs and staffs and stuff, and college mm -hmm. folks are already done. Like. You know the the cycle has passed at this point. If, yeah. if somebody gets fired, they're moving to an interim situation until next year. So it's not happening, but still, just saying. Yeah. Anyway, guys, we're gonna get out of here. You guys rock. You're awesome. Thanks. This so is how much long we can us. go, by the way, without talking football. I guess actually most of you on Club Sixty Five have missed that, but this is a very normal thing that Brent and I, well, Brent mostly talk about is football. But you may not know, but a huge part of Brent's life, you got the hat and stuff, he used to be a pretty big deal in the uh in the tampa bay buccaneers world that's a, i i yes yeah it was yeah it was there was there was a lot with uh get i i was very early in the world of working with podcasts and working directly with the nfl and helping oddly through this really small market crappy team helping them define their protocols for how podcasts should be treated as media or not treated as media which the NFL was watching what Tampa was doing and took a lot of that that I got to work with and, and applied that really across the league. And I'm sure things have grown and changed uh, since I stepped out of that space. But I mean, that's where all of this is coming from, you know, and, and at, it is a personal fandom of mine. So I can't quit it. I would love to. Yeah, so we got about, I can't quit it. we had about six weeks of not talking about football. Uh, but those those are fast. I'm, so. I'm fiending. I am so fiending right now, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I need stuff. And I hate the draft. I hate the draft with a passion. Yeah. People thrive on this stuff, and I can't stand it. Mostly because people are reviewing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of college people for a team that's going to get six or seven of those guys and they're yeah. not going to be right. And you can't do an accurate mock because you're not going to accurately predict the trades and stuff that happen. Like I would rather just wait to see who we actually get. And then let's review those folks, mm -hmm. but people got to have something to talk about this time of year and they don't have anything else to talk about. So and there's a lot to whatever. talk about. There's a reason when I play mad and I skip all the other picks to my, I'm just like, I don't care. Like uh, when, when I matter. do, when I do a mock draft, I go, I go to the, the draft networks, mock, mock draft simulator. And I just let the computer run all the other teams because mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not researching everybody else's team and doing what they do. I know what my team does. I know what their tendencies are. And I, I, I have actually surprisingly been fairly accurate on a lot of my picks yeah. lately, but anyway, yeah, cool. uh, you guys rock. You guys are awesome. I'm going to get out of here. Jeff, you're going to get out of here and uh, we'll talk to you guys next week. See you in a week.